Hey all here at OS Reviews, in today's retro throwback review, we are revisiting the T-Mobile G2, also known as the HTC Desire Z in international countries. This was a follow-up to the original G1, which some of you guys may remember as the original Android phone. It was the first ever Android smartphone, and it retains a special place in the history of smartphones for bringing a new operating system to the market, but it had a pretty funky build as well as a design design that wasn't exactly attractive, it in fact felt like a brick in the hand. Part of the reason why the first Android phone had a keyboard was because the original version of Android, version 1.5, didn't even come with support for a virtual on-screen keyboard until later on, so a hardware keyboard was a requirement. The G2 was billed as the next model in the series, and it was a continued collaboration between Google and HTC. The version in the United States with T-Mobile, in fact, actually is very stock in the sense that they didn't have any launcher or skin on top of the Android experience. There is no HTC uh, Sense UI, for example. Everything is pretty much still vanilla Android 2.2 Froyo. In addition, that's why you see a lot of preloaded Google apps on this phone out of the box. All of their Google apps, in fact, at the time, including Google Goggles, Places, Google Earth, Google Sky, Latitude, Google Translate, some of these services which are no longer really popular, but it was interesting to have that moment captured through this phone. In contrast to the original G1, the G2 was a pretty big leap forwards in terms of a much sleeker device replaced by a much more reasonable slimness, considering the fact that this is also a slider phone. In fact, the sliding mechanism is really what makes this phone unique from a hardware perspective. Um, it now has what's called a Z hinge, which basically pushes the screen upwards above the keyboard here and then flips over to then snap itself into place. So it kind of lifts up and then detaches downwards, which is a very interesting action. So it's not quite as thick as on the original G1, for example, where there's an obvious kind of leveling down between the keyboard and screen, and the mechanism does feel still very sturdy and pretty elegant, although quite unusual for slider phones. Instead of sliding directly up, having this up and down movement, which was pretty novel at the time, and uh, even to this day, we don't have really another keyboard phone in the market that shares the same hinge design. Also built with more premium materials, including an aluminum frame, as well as some soft touch rubber that felt much better than the entire plastic used on the original, which was also cheaper, more like a prototype in terms of the hardware and build. It was also around the same time though that HTC brought out other flagships, including their original HTC Desire, although the Desire uses the aforementioned HTC Sense user interface on top of the operating system. All of these devices had a 3.7 inch display, which was an IPS LCD, which has decent viewing angles. Now you may be noticing that the screen here seems a little bit shaky at times and colors may seem a little unnatural. And that's because one of the flaws of the HTC G2 was ironically enough, the hinge mechanism it's pretty easy to observe that this little portion in the middle here is the ribbon cable, which connects the screen as well as the components of the phone together. And because this cable here is for the most part exposed, it's quite easy for the connection to get a little bit loose, and after repeated usage of the hinge, it can make things uh, start to get a little bit shaky. Here in 2020, the only keyboard phone on the market that runs on Android is pretty much the FX Pro 1, but that's also a pretty expensive device. It's also not a direct sliding up action, but has a slightly more complicated mechanics, perhaps a little closer to the Sidekick 4G, which also kind of slides open in a slightly more interesting way than just directly up on a rail, but has kind of a pop-up action to it. So this seems to be the mechanism that has uh, still been replicated and continued to be used in the newer uh, keyboard phones here in 2020. Otherwise, uh, system specs included a Qualcomm Snapdragon processor, but it was clocked at 800 megahertz, uh, which even back then was a little bit behind some of the one gigahertz phones that we were beginning to see. It also came with half a gig of built-in RAM. There was access to a micro USB port for charging, a volume rocker, which was pretty tactile and responsive, Top here featured a 3.5mm headphone jack and a power on off switch. The side here also featured a dedicated camera shutter key, which is always nice to see. The camera on the rear is rated at 5 megapixels with an LED flash, but missing on the front, it would be a front facing camera, so there's no 
opportunity here for selfies or Skype, anything like that, uh, which was unfortunately a omission at the time. On the bottom there, there was the typical touch-sensitive keys for navigating Android. However, these buttons are pretty small, and as a result, it's quite easy to hit the on-screen controls um, as opposed to them. They're kind of squished down there. But there's also an optical trackpad here, uh, which is more of a remnant of earlier days of smartphones and Blackberries that you can use to control smaller icons, use it as a mouse. So all in all, I think it's still a pretty clean looking phone design. I think it's especially that Z axis hinge, which makes it pretty interesting and unique. And uh, over here, we have a pretty comfortable island or chiclet style keys, which are quite tactile and responsive. Although if you didn't like the physical keyboard, there was always the virtual on-screen one, which also supports swipe. So you can use it to more quickly type out things with predictive text, and that works reasonably well too, although the fact that you have a keyboard on this phone, you should probably make use of it, especially since it's a pretty solid one for typing. Another idea at the time that HTC built was rather ahead of the curve would be customizable shortcuts that you could access on the keyboard. So these three little dots here that you see with the silver icons are customizable hotkeys that you can use to take you into any application by tapping down on it. So for example, if we tap on this key here, it says that this is a quick key by tapping on continue and it gives you various options, things like taking you to the dialer pad, opening up a specific app like GPS, music, navigation, applications, settings, turning on or off Wi-Fi, all of those can be toggled by the simple click of a key, which is actually very useful and convenient. The other two I've already programmed here for a quick demo. One of them here just takes me to the Wi-Fi settings, another one here takes me into the keyboard settings. So uh, the fact that you have this flexibility is really neat. We can revisit the camera here by jumping into it. All I can say is, although it's functional, it's not anything to really write home about. The interface just offers geotagging, different white balance options. That's pretty much it. There's no adjustments for things like HDR, which really wasn't popular yet um, at the time. It takes a moment for the images to be snapped into focus, but the phone does offer pinch to zoom support. And uh, overall, the level of detail is decent for a phone from 10 years ago. As far as the other applications are concerned, the surprising thing is a handful of them are definitely still functional. Uh, even though it's running on a pretty out-of-date version of Android, again, Android 2.2 Froyo, you can still find some legacy apps supported, although performance is definitely going to feel quite sluggish by today's standards. Uh, the browser here still works to a certain extent, uh, but again, more complex sites requiring more memory will sometimes struggle to load uh, by default. But we can do things like type, for example, HDC Desire Z, and do a quick test of seeing how it functions. Wi-Fi reception still seems decent, but even very quick Google searches, again, take longer than perhaps what we're used to by our modern day phones. Basic tasks though will definitely still be functional, things like sending out text messages, um, if you're doing some quick word or document editing using Word2Go, uh, that definitely still works, things like that, but uh, it's not going to be the most powerful device anymore. So that is more or less it as far as your revisited look, just a quick throwback review of the HTC G2, also known as the Desire Z. Again, we've come a long way in terms of Android smartphones, from the days where keyboards were very common uh, to now where keyboard phones are very rare. Still, it was an exciting point in time for Android, which was showing rapid development. And uh, the G2 in particular was a huge leap forward compared to the original G1 in terms of being sleeker and more elegant, more well-built in almost every way. A very interesting phone to look back on. For now, that's been our video. Thanks for watching here at OS Reviews. That was a trip down memory lane with the T-Mobile G2, also known as the HTC Desire C.